Ah. Got it. Okay. And I'm also going to enable live transcript. Um, so officially, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Adara Goldberg, and I am the director of the Holocaust Resource Center and Diversity Council here at Kane. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for this special program that has been, you know, about a year and a half in the making. So we really thank, you know, our keynote speaker for tonight, Irene Shaland, for her patience um, in waiting. You know, we had hoped that the world would be as such that we could have Irene in person right now. Yes. Um, but out of an abundance of caution, we decided to make today's program virtual so that we could reach everybody as safely as possible. So again, you know, welcome to Irene. Irene is an internationally published Jewish historian, educator, and an art and travel writer. Her research, publications, and lectures are focused on the multiple issues that illuminate the diaspora experience, looking at the rich tapestry of global and international experiences, culture, and heritage through a variety of lenses. Um, she also writes and presents on global responses to the Holocaust. And that is of course going to be our topic this afternoon. Um, in addition to all of Irene's travel work, um, she is a regular presenter at organizations such as the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York City, the Hidden Child Foundation, um, and the Anti-Defamation League. What I'm going to do is turn things over to Irene in a moment, Again, ask everybody to please make note of your questions. And if you need anything during the program, um, if there's something that you know, can't wait, that's an urgent you know, question, just raise your hand. And Kara Stark-Stapa, who many of you know, she is currently named HRC Kane. Um, she will call on you. So with that, I am going to turn things over to Irene and welcome you officially. Thank you, Adara. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm so honored to be here with you today uh, with educators, professional educators and teachers who dedicated uh, their careers to teaching the history of the Holocaust. And why, why do we do that? Why do we teach Holocaust stories and our Holocaust memories? Is it to capture uh, the attention of the mind of our student just for a moment with the horrors of the Holocaust? Or it to pass down lessons from one generation to the next, la door, la door? Or maybe it's to ensure that our histories are never get lost. Maybe each story that we have has its own reason to be told. Italian writer and Auschwitz survivor Prima Levi said, without remembrance, there is no future. And... and let's see, maybe my computer fell asleep. Thank you, Alex. So our goal today, the goal of our presentation of our workshop is what and why, first of all, to determine the purpose of the Holocaust education. I see it as the only answer, the only link between the horrific past and the future where atrocities like that would not be uh, even thinkable. The end of horror is in remembrance. Ellie Weissel said, memory is the key word which combines past and present, past and future. And secondly, how, how we do that? For me, and excuse me, I'm an unrepentant project manager that lives by deadlines and schedules and deliverables. For me, it's important to have a general framework to construct this framework that would uh, be applicable for both research and education. I am convinced that uh, the destiny of the victims during the Holocaust depended on three key factors. The first one is the history of the Jews in the region or the country, like take Poland or take Denmark, right? Very different 
uh, uh, histories. Secondly, the degree of control exercised by the Nazis. And again, Denmark is exemplary protectorate or Poland or any other country in East Europe. And very important, the behavior of the locals. We, uh, for example, the island of Corsica where 15,000 Jews were saved from the Southwest of France, just because Corsicans could not, they were not looking at Jews as Jews, but the people who were running away from injustice. Or take Austria, Hitler's villain executioners to paraphrase the title of David Goldberg's uh, book, when overnight uh, neighbors, co-workers, co-business co owners turned into very inventive tortures. Uh, and we will try to apply this framework for any of the four countries we will be visiting and talking about this afternoon. And the third one, it's big Jewish no. So what? What lessons can we learn? What we as Americans living in the 21st century, as Jewish and non-Jewish Americans, what lessons can we learn from the history in uh, Norway? or in China for that matter. What also important for me, but uh, not always possible, probably in the school environment when you're constrained for half, by half an hour, 45 minutes of the session, what's important for me is to create a bigger picture, to let my audience and my readers appreciate the general history of the country, it, the history of, of its people, to understand its arts and its architecture. And so we will begin with Scandinavia. Why Scandinavia? Why we're not going to Central Europe, the epicenter of the Holocaust? And I do in my other lectures, but uh, Scandinavia is a part of Europe renowned for its inclusiveness and tolerance and understanding appreciation of differences. It's most educated and cultural area, I think, among the European country with the least income disparities. It's also you have, you come to the region of Europe that extremely conscious of the environment. Over 50% of Scandinavian garbage is recycled and almost 25% of the energy provided by windmills. But when you're talking about Scandinavia, what a uh, phrase may pop up in your mind. And I give you a hint, Shakespeare. Remember, something is rotten in the state of Denmark and that's what officer says in Hamlet. And uh, when we were planning our first trip to Scandinavia, I thought, oh, no way. The old bar didn't know what he was talking about. So what Scandinavia is known for? Oh yeah, it's high latitudes, it's very cold. It's stunning natural beauty. It's uh, uh, incredible, super modern uh, architecture. It's trend-setting designs. It's liberal politics and values. And of course, Viking ships and brooding castles and it's ancient wooden churches and great royal capitals and fun-loving cities with the best nightlife you can meet and uh, encounter anywhere else in Europe. And uh, Scandinavia also the least populated part of Europe. It's the least church going. And unfortunately for me, I'm so involved in travel, uh, in a, the least appreciated by American tourists. It's also of course highly, most highly taxed and socialistic, but it's one of the most interesting and enjoyable places in the world. But uh, as Alex and I were researching the history of Scandinavia, reading uh, newspaper articles and articles sent to us, like for example, what does it mean to be Jewish in Sweden, shut up and fade into the woods, uh, we realized that this almost perfect, everything for people, highly organized civilization, has its very dark sides. So maybe Shakespeare did know what he was talking about. So let's go to Norway. 
It's, uh, can you see it on the map? It's kind of like beige yellow. Uh, it's slightly larger than the state of Montana to give you an idea of the size with the population slightly larger than half of population in Manhattan Island, 5 million people. Norway is one of the richest countries in the world. It consistently tops every survey of wealth and quality of life. But as one of our Jewish friends in Norway said that, oh, well, very soon Norway can top another shocking ranking the, to become the first country in Europe, Juden Frey, the Nazi term for the ethnic cleansing of the Jews. But first, let me take you to Norway the beautiful. When we were there in the last half of May, a few years ago, it was very cold, very rainy and very windy. And at the same time, incredibly, almost surreally beautiful. Well, my husband, the photographer, uh, was upset by the light. He was going, boo, 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 light is bad, light is bad. There will be no good pictures, but I love it. It was an unreal feeling. Do you know where we are now in this shot? We're on the roof of the opera house of Oslo, marble roof. Here it is. It looks like giant iceberg sliding into the icy waters of Oslo Fjord. And this roof doubles as public square. You can run it up and down. People do skateboarding, but we did not. And in those two and a half days when Norway, when Oslo has sun, people sun based on the roof. When we were there, and I know it's even a pandemic did not slow it down. Oslo was, beating, uh, was in a building frenzy. Everything everywhere, you know, they, you can see construction. They were working with the best architect the world has to offer. And we thought maybe it's a global forum upcoming. Maybe they will win the Olympic to become a site for the Olympics. There was no global forum. There were no Olympics. Oslo was just trying to become the best livable city it could be. And here, look at that. It's a museum of modern art by Renzo Piano. If you've seen Whitney Museum of American Art, the new one, well, it's not very new anymore, and uh, downtown Manhattan, it's Renzo Piano. Uh, Center of Georges Pompidou, it's Renzo Piano. Uh, and our friends who were in Norway during unusually hot summer, they saw many young boys on this roof jumping down into the waters of the fjord. And Norway of the Vikings. There is a museum, very impressive museum in Oslo that showcases two uh, finally crafted these majestic Viking ships. But imagine Vikings went from Scandinavia, they went as far as uh, present day France or England or even to New World. And these ships from 9th and 10th century. At that time, Europeans going to bed when they were praying, they would say, oh Lord, and save me from the Vikings. Uh, yes, yeah, Vikings, the ancestors of today's Scandinavians, they indeed were uh, ruthless pirates, but they also were great seamen, shipbuilders, explorers. Without the Vikings, Europe would look very, very different. Uh, between the year 800 and year 1000, like 9th century, 11th century, the uh, uh, Vikings from Denmark, from present day Denmark, they founded Dublin. And they also settled, uh, they also ruled southern part of England. Vikings from Norway, uh, they settled the region of Normandy. Normandy means Norse man. The Swedes, went into Russia. And according to a number of historic for, uh, sources, they founded uh, Kiev and Nizhny Novgorod. Norwegian Viking Eric the Red was among the first settlers in Iceland. And his son, Leif Erikson, discovered North America. Well, there are a few scientists who disputed, but for me, I love Leif Erikson, and he had the same color of hair that I do. So I feel related. Uh, so we've seen few cars with bumper sticker. It was Columbus who followed the Viking map. 
Norway of Norway of the fjord. If you do not have time for two weeks cruise along the Norwegian fjords, like we did not, you don't have to despair because you can take two hours cruise on the fjords of Oslo and enjoy it very much. And you can see this tiny lighthouse, so all fjord churches that now are very popular venues for weddings. And by the way, contemporary Vikings, Norwegians, uh, love to sail and Oslo has more boats and yachts than they have people. Uh, Oslo, the theatrical, that's a national theater. They have performances on Norwegian and then the same play is given in English. I wish we were there when they did get a gobbler. On the left, you see the monument to Henrik Ibsen. Without Ibsen, we would not have Eugene O'Neill or Tennessee Williams or Chekhov and the entire canon of the 20th century theater. That's his idea of illusion versus reality in Wild Duck. That's the godmother of modern theater. Oslo of the arts. There is a great museum dedicated only for Edward to Edward Monk. But if you don't have a time for that, or you have time just for one museum, I strongly advise go to the National Art Museum. There you will see wonderful collection of landscapes by Norwegian artists that you won't see anywhere else. And at least 40 paintings by month, like this one, the famous screen. Uh, and my husband said that if you saw those prices in Oslo, you would scream like this too. museums. When I was a child, I was absolutely uh, bewitched by the stories, by the books of Thor Heyerdahl, who wanted to show that uh, early South Americans, they settled Polynesia. They have a museum dedicated just to his voyage on Kantiki, so the whole story. And the entire country and Oslo, and it, all big cities in Norway and Oslo, everywhere you see sculptures. It's like giant sculpture park. And our favorite was absolutely do not miss park dedicated to one sculptor whose name is Vigeland. He studied with Rembrandt, or with, sorry, with uh, Rodin. And like Rodin, he was fascinated by yin and yang uh, aspects of male, female relationships. He would never name his sculptures. He would refuse to explain anything he did. But, and he would say my entire life story in this sculpture. So you can see on the left what critics called husband and wife talking. And on the right, man and the babies. And it's not clear he's playing with them or he's throwing them around, but it's uh, all about Vigilant. If it's his story, you know, his many marriages failed. He had terrible relationship with all of his children, but his sculptures are very, very interesting and intriguing. And now we're coming to Norwegian history. In the center of Oslo, you can find historical park. In the middle of it, it's Akershus Fortress, which used to be an important military stronghold in 1300s and the seat of the king. If you see how the royal palace looked like, you know, it brings up uh, the idea that the country might be very, very poor. And it was. It's a medieval Norway was very poor country. And it's good places any to talk about uh, Jewish history in Norway, government decreed anti-Semitism. The history of this government anti-Semitism that was coming from the government in Norway goes back over a millennium. In the year 1000, King Kolov forbade everyone who was not Christian to live in Norway. In 1436, it was the first time when Jews were specifically singled out because the prohibition was issued and then repeatedly reinforced to abolish a day of rest on Saturday, lest Christians might, God forbid, replicate the evil way of the Jews. From the early 1500 until 1814, 
Norway was Danish colony. It was part of the kingdom of Denmark. And during this time, numerous religious restrictions were issued to uphold Protestantism in general and persecute the Jews in particular. Every foreigner in the kingdom had to affirm their commitment to the Lutheran. Remember, they were Lutherans and are Lutherans. Their uh, commitment to Lutheran, uh, Lutheran faith on pain of deportation or even death. In 1577, enters Danish king, who was also king of Norway, named Christian IV of Denmark. And here I have to have a very brief um, historic remark that I'm sure in the future you will thank me for that. If anyone will ask you who is now the king of Denmark, you can say either Friedrich Christian or Christian Friedrich, and you would be right because they either Christian and Friedrich, Christian Friedrich. And it makes Danish royalty the easiest royal history to navigate by their kings. So Christian IV of Denmark and Norway uh, was Renaissance man who understood the Jews could be not just good, could be great source of income and great for economy. So he allowed for the first time in 1577, he allowed some very rich and well-connected Jews in the areas of finance and trade to enter the country. But his grandson, Christian V, and believe me, there was Friedrich in between, Christian IV, Friedrich, Christian V, he resigned these privileges. Jews, uh, we did not uh, were not allowed to enter the country. They were those who lived there were expelled and those who would enter have to convert to a uh, Lutheran religion or to be jailed and then sent out of the country. If they return again, they would be put to death. Uh, and that was going on until 1814 when this government decreed anti-Semitism transitioned into constitutionally uh, governed anti-Semitism. So what happened beginning of the 19th century, Napoleonic Wars, Denmark takes the wrong side. So when Napoleon lost uh, by the treaty, uh, Versailles Treaty, Denmark had to secede its prized colony uh, of Norway to Sweden. Norwegian were ecstatic. They had this short-lived dream of becoming independent. And they quickly wrote the constitution of 1814. Uh, they wrote, they produced one of the most progressive and liberal constitutions of that period in Europe. However, the second paragraph said, these people, the Jews, always have been rebellious and deceitful. They have acquired some remarkable fortunes that led them into intrigues. It is of vital importance to the security of our country, Norway, that an absolute exception be made about them. And this ban for Jews never entering uh, Norway persisted until 1851. One person led fight for taking away this paragraph to becoming modern people, tolerant, understanding, open to all religion. It was a national poet, uh, Brigland. And finally in 1851, Jews became um, legal. They were allowed to enter the country. The first 25 of them did. Uh, six years after the poet's death. And every year in the anniversary of his death, Jewish community of Norway has a memorial uh, service uh, for this poet. So we're still inside um, this castle and this now, this building now, the Museum of Norwegian Resistance. And this where Wittgen Quislin, the head of the collaborationist government of Norway was shot in 1945. So what was going on during the war? In 1940, about 2,100 Jews lived in the country. 
almost all of them were fully assimilated Norwegian citizens. But after the Norwegian collaboration this government took over with Wittgen Kisling in its head, they were so good in implementing final solution. All Nazis anti-Jewish legislations that the Germans just said fine and they step back. The Norwegians know what they are doing. To identify Jewish and Norwegians, the government relied on information from the police, from telegraph uh, services. And, and while the synagogues and Jewish burial societies were ordered to produce full rosters of their members and even non-members they knew about. The resulting list were cross-checked against information uh, from the Norwegian Central Bureau of Statistics, and most importantly, uh, with the information eagerly provided by enthusiastic private citizens. In the end, due to this terrific support from the local population, Norway had more complete list of its Jewish residents than most other countries under Nazi occupations. And uh, in 1942, deportation began. First 700 people were sent to Auschwitz and then remaining 150 were sent to Auschwitz. To its uh, record, Norwegian resistant fighters were able to save almost 40% of Norwegian Jewish population, taking them on foot to Sweden. Uh, so what's happening now? What the government responds to Holocaust? Norway became the first country in 1997 that uh, wrote and implemented restitution law. First of the countries to do that, to provide money to those who suffered during the Holocaust. In the year 2000, Norwegian government uh, first commissioned uh, and then 100% funded the first uh, Holocaust monument in the country. It's called, you're looking at it, it's called the Site of Remembrance. Uh, the British uh, artist, uh, Anthony Golan, uh, constructed it. And he said that, uh, that his quote, the Holocaust cannot be represented. I wanted to make a place to remember, to make a bridge between the living and the dead in order that these events and their implications should not be lost. And the site is very evocative. The wall you see in the back, this is this fortress. And uh, cheers without the seat, cheers facing the fjord from which Norwegian Jews uh, were deported. After the war, and that's an interesting fact and not widely publicized. Norway refused to allow survivors of the deportees, survivors to come back from the camps. But when we get to Sweden, we'll be talking about the white buses that in the last months of the war, uh, sponsored by Swedish government, these buses went from camp to camp, trying to get survivors, whether they were relatives of the Swedes, or they were Danish, or they were Norwegians. Norway would not allow its survivors to come back. The reason was they're not Norwegian citizens. How come? Oh, yeah, they were. But when they were deported, they stopped being Norwegian citizens. So survivors of uh, Holocaust of Norway were taken to the city of Malmo in Sweden. So what does it mean to live as a Jewish Norwegian today? We went uh, to the Jewish uh, Museum of Oslo. Right now, Jewish community of Norway is about 1,200 to 1,300 people. And the Jews of Norway mostly live in Oslo and Trondheim. And Oslo is the largest community. So in a population of 5.3 million, Jews is the tiniest of the tiniest minority, which never prevented them from being noticed. There is a growing tide of anti-Semitism and violent anti-Semitic attack in Norway going on. Uh, next to uh, the museum, at that time it was only next to the museum now, so you can find those stepping stones in bronze 
over in different places in Oslo and Trondheim with the name of the deportees, the year when they were deported, and often, if it's known what was the camp, most often it's Auschwitz. We saw the people passing by all the time, nobody stops. And this is how a museum looks like. At our time, it had a wonderful exhibit commemorating Jews of Norway, Remember Us into life. We talked to a young man who works at the museum. He was at that time architecture student. Uh, and he, for us, he, Lior Habash was his name. For us, he personified modern diverse Norway. His mother is Norwegian Jew uh, with roots in Belarus. Her parents were from Belarus and his maternal grandparents from Belarus live in Israel. His father is Yemenite a Jewish Israeli and he considered himself Norwegian, but he was painfully aware, he told us, of this duality. He said, I'm Norwegian, I love Oslo, but I feel split between two worlds, an Israeli and a Norwegian. And it's very important to me to be Norwegian but I'm a Jew, first of all. He told us he does not feel safe going to work at the Jewish Museum, and he plans to leave Norway, and he did. He did live, we stayed in touch, uh, and settle in Israel. And he told us that most of his friends have similar plans. He also told us that there is a growing interest among non-Jewish Norwegians to learn more about Jewish history in general and Norwegian Jewish history in particular, and people are coming in large groups to the museum. He advises to come to another museum, Center for Studies of the Holocaust and Religious Minorities. On the left, you can see this mirror-like uh, sculpture. It's giant and it's called uh, Innocent Questions. The author, the sculptor Arnold Dreyblad said that it's a kind of like computer card. It represents innocent questions that were asked about who you are, who are your parents, but the answers were used for compiling the list of Jewish Norwegians and the deportation. Most of the exhibits about anti-Semitism and racial hatred in Norwegian because they are done for Norwegian, for the students, for Holocaust education uh, and for Holocaust studies teachers and their students. But we had a wonderful guide, our friend who is the director of program and Melby. And she brought us this first study done in Norway, anti-Semitism in Norway with question mark. And she was very, very optimistic about the future. She feels that education is the only answer. But just recently I read that Imam of Norway who is very active in interface dialogue with different other religions, including Jewish uh, in Europe, Privately, he in his Facebook, he was publishing very anti-Semitic comments and remarks. And rabbis from France and Belgium, they were very upset by it. So that was just a small incident. And recently, we've seen this uh, cartoon in the newspaper. In this clip, man plays Scrabble with a Haredi Jew, with Orthodox Jew. And this man is frustrated because he cannot use derogatory term. You see, it's Jewish swine, Jude swine, uh, to score the points he wanted. So what lessons did we bring from Norway? What's important? Our initial goal was to understand how and why Norway responds to the Holocaust within the Norwegian Jewish narrative. What does it mean to be Jewish Norwegian today? Did we get our answers? Is the Jewish story of today's Norway all about young people that leave the country to build their lives elsewhere? Young Jewish people. Or is it a narrative of a very, very comfortable and prosperous life that punctuated now and then by examples of rabbit of violent Jew hatred? Or does it promote belief, like Anne Melba explained to us, in extensive education as the best way to fight bigotry and to open hearts and minds? We were not 
quite sure at that time and not quite sure today. And to see more complete picture of Jewish, Jewish story within a Scandinavian context, we flew to Sweden, the country that during World War II became safe haven for most of the Scandinavian jury. Uh, and you can see Sweden now. So what's it famous for? It depends on my audience. Sometimes young people start yelling, Volvo, they make Volvo. Not very young people say it's home for IKEA. Yeah. And people who are older than previous two groups, they say that's ABBA. <laughs> so who remembers ABBA now? It, uh, somebody told me, oh, it's larger than Denmark, but it's flatter than Norway. And I like it. I quote my friend there. 80% uh, of Sweden is wilderness, and they still have the ancient law that guarantees people right to move freely anywhere in Sweden, even if it's your backyard, and you permit them to put their tent there because they love the view. Uh, wanted to bring up the declaration of the Jewish communities of Sweden, written shortly after the Crystal Nut. We will be judged in our own time and in the future by measuring the aid that we, inhabitants of a free and fortunate country, gave to our brethren in this time of greatest disaster. And it was written in 1938, and it was truer then than anybody could imagine. And just uh, yesterday, it started October 12th through October 13th, there was a very important, highly publicized international event. Malmo International Forum of Holocaust Remembrance and Combating Antisemitism. Why Malmo? If you look at the map, unfortunately, I still look for my <laughs> pointer. Uh, you see Stockholm. On the left, you can see uh, Gothenburg, the second largest city, and Malmo down below. It's south to the east. Why they wanted to have this forum in Malmo? Because Malmo, since the first years, earlier years of the 21st century, became a hotbed for violent anti Semitism, not just swastikas written on memorial stones or in synagogues, uh, but Molotov cocktails thrown into kindergarten, into plain children, or into uh, Jewish funeral uh, houses. And it's been going on for almost 15 years. See, when we began planning Scandinavia, for me, Sweden, my understanding of Sweden in the Jewish context of the Jewish narrative was of a noble rescue of the Scandinavian Hungarian Jewry and the pluralistic state that officially recognizes Yiddish as one of its five minority languages, but how would I reconcile this idea of Sweden with the image of Malmo? Here is on this slide on the left is the synagogue where children even today in kindergarten play behind bulletproof glass and it's considered normal. Uh, just a couple years ago, a uh, spokesman for the Jewish community of Malmo, Frederick Siratsky, uh, said that probably very soon this community would need to dissolve itself, just like happened in another city in Umea on the north, when a small Jewish community, Jews just left and it stopped to exist. The organization, federation said we don't exist anymore. And it was over um, virus of indifference, indifference why the city, uh, and mayor and the government and violent attacks by neo-Nazis and by radical groups of new immigrant from uh, Middle Eastern countries. So it's very complicated picture, but the forum itself was, was sponsored by the government. Uh, Prime Minister of Sweden was there and uh, by World Jewish Congress uh, Ronald, Ronald Lauder uh, spoke and the heads of different Jewish communities. So it's a 
step in the right direction, how to combat anti-Semitism. On the right, it's a photograph of Anika uh, Hermos Rothstein, who is a Swedish writer and political advisor, pro-Israel activist. And in recent interview, she said, I have two sons and I have to choose between giving them strong, positive Jewish identity and keeping them safe. And I don't see that this is a choice I have to make. And a few years ago, Annika Rothstein uh, asked for political asylum in her own country. She did it in purpose as a PR act to bring attention to Scandinavian countries, to Sweden in particular, and citing well-founded reasons for being afraid to be Jewish in Switzerland, uh, in uh, Sweden. But I wanted to show you the beauty of Sweden as well. It again was all bluish and grayish air, and I felt we're within some magic crystal. And Alex was afraid it's not the right light for the photographs. We're looking at Gamla Stan, the heart of historical Stockholm. And here is Lucen, the bridge over canal. Fresh water of Lake Malaren meets salt water of Baltic Sea coming together. That's why Stockholm was always so important. Stockholm of the Nobel Prize. And there's a concert call where every December uh, the king gives out Nobel Prizes. And after that, the winners go to this building in national romantic style, which is the city hall of Stockholm. Why? Because they will have their celebratory dinner in this blue hall. There are 1,300 people. And if you win the Nobel Prize and you're allowed to bring one guest, make sure that your guest is like a very slim size zero because you know how much place they allocate for each person? 21 inches. So keep it in mind when you get your Nobel Prize when selecting the guest. It's called the blue room. Do you see any blue color? I don't. Because the architect, Ragnar Olsberg, studied in Italy. He was so fascinated by Italian architecture. He wanted this hall to look like lodges in Siena. with an open, with no ceiling, open to the sky. But hello, in Sweden, they have three days with the sun. So of course there is a ceiling, but the title blue room is there. Uh, Theater of Sweden, you can see in the uh, middle another great playwright, August Strindberg. And to see modern art of Stockholm or Sweden for that matter, you have to ride the, uh, the subway, all 110 kilometers, because there you will see so exciting stories that extend from artistic pioneers of the 1950s to the art experiments of today. And Stockholm, just like Oslo, it's a giant sculpture park with our favorite being the tiniest of them, the iron, tiny, choo -choo -choo, uh, iron boy. And it's a uh, uh, start to honor the orphans who had to carry heavy cargo from the sea ships. Remember this uh, Slusen from the sea ships to those who were on the lakes. And grandmas need him hat for winter. That's one of my most favorite kings in Sweden, Gustav III, who turned shabby merchant port in the sophisticated European capital. He loved the arts and he founded many theaters. And poor thing was assassinated at his masquerade ball. And this event inspired Verdi to write his opera ball uh, masquerade. And this is Charles XII, not my favorite king, but very important because this is the beginning of the Swedish Jewish narrative. We studied him back in Russia. Uh, it's cool when his, uh, we knew that Charles or Charles XII, he went on Moscow and he was beaten by great Russian czar, Peter the Great. And so here, Charles XII shows points toward Moscow, go get them. So why he's in the beginning of Jewish history? And this I have to, 
read to you uh, something from the ordinance, not issued by Charles XII, but by Charles XI, his father. We will be judged now on, on sorry, that's, uh, that was an ordinance that no Jews should be allowed in the country. But unlike Norway, no death threat was implemented. But uh, Karl or Charles XII, he was war hungry. He spent many years fighting different wars and of course accumulated many deaths. When he returned back to Stockholm, his creditors followed and among these creditors were many Jews. So he decided what if I let Jews to live there freely, uh, go uh, with their traditions, build their synagogues, maybe they would leave me alone and he did. So in 1782, a few hundred Jews come to Stockholm and they build the synagogue. Now they're building at the Jewish Museum of Stockholm. And this is um, building is part of Sweden I know and love. It's a pie there. European Institute for Jewish Studies in Sweden was formed in the year 2000. It's non-denominational entity and entirely supported by Swedish government. It's Monday to focus on reviving a Jewish voice that was silenced for so long by communism and post-war Holocaust trauma. A voice they say that will contribute to culturally rich and pluralistic Europe. But at the same time, uh, government of Sweden prohibits kosher slaughter and outlaws uh, circumcision. And um, Annika Rothstein wrote, what frightens me most is that my government is prescribing Jewish life by outlawing circumcision, banning kosher slaughter and telling us forthrightly that the only way to avoid being harassed in the streets is to distance ourselves from Israel. They're reinventing the conditions of Eastern Europe past that brought our families to this country in the first place. So I wrote the question, what does it mean to be Jewish today in Sweden? And the head of Jewish uh, PR of Jewish community information director, uh, John Gradovsky met us at the beautiful synagogue. We could not meet first at the sanctuary because it was full, full of people, non-Jewish who would come twice a month to study Jewish history and Jewish traditions in the synagogue. So John took us outside to the wall of names where relative of Swedish Jewish citizens, uh, their names were written, 8,500 people. Remember that unlike Norway and most European countries for that matter, Sweden does not have the same painful history of government complicity in the Holocaust. And inside you can see uh, this blue stone brought from the Budapest ghetto and the rails that carried the deportation trains from Hungary to Auschwitz. It was a very interesting conversation with John Gradovsky. When we discussed situation in Malmo, he said, well, he believes that there are two tracks for every immigrant group entering Sweden. First track leads directly to people assimilating into European culture or in becoming Swedish in a sense that they would support pluralism and um, it uh, accept that it celebrates the differences. Second track for people who are uh, less educated, did not know anything better, they brought a lot of anger, but eventually they will join the first track. It was very optimistic that it should happen. He showed us uh, the flight with a Torah, an interesting sculpture created by Russian born Swedish Jewish artist, and it's a memorial to Sweden as a safe haven during the Holocaust. Another important memorial is Raoul Wollenberg's, who it's considered one of the most controversial Holocaust memorials. It's a giant uh, this, uh, sphere with uh, the same phrase circling this granite globe again and again. It starts in, in multiple languages, it starts first in Swedish, then in English, then follows by 22 languages representing the Holocaust victims 
native language. It starts with Polish, it's the largest victim group. And this says, the road was straight when Jews were deported to death. The road was winding, dangerous, and full of obstacles when Jews were trying to escape from the murders. Huh? For me, it was very unsatisfactory language of commemoration and almost meaningless. And staying there, Alex and I, we were discussing tragic fate of Raoul Wallenberg. He is venerated, as you know very well, in, in the United States, in Israel, in Hungary, in other countries for his rescue mission. But he was never given strong recognition as his native country. When we talk to people, uh, I uh, could summarize three different reasons. One, uh, was that, well, he came from the family that was involved in banking and had dealings with the Germans. Second, that his mission was murky, a curious mixture of Swedish diplomacy with American dollars, with American war refugee board. And so, well, he arrived in Budapest too late in July 1944, when approximately 400,000 Hungarian Jews already were deported. It was not his choice. We may probably never know how many lives Wallenberg actually saved. What we do know that he had incredible courage and he was committed to life. He was one person who make a huge difference. He chose to stand up for the Jews when most of the world uh, looked away. And his strange, tragic disappearance into the Soviet gulag was never resolved. After the breakup of the Soviet Union, there were a few committees, Swedish and Russians, trying to understand why was he arrested in the first place? Why was not he let go by the Soviets when they liberated Hungary, along with his other colleagues? And nothing is resolved. For me, the strange indifference and inactivity of the Swedish government in the critical uh, time when Wallenberg was arrested, for me, it's nothing but uh, maybe even intentional diplomatic blunder that few generations later, Sweden still has the result. And uh, at the end of our time in Stockholm, we met with a young girl who was a tour guide in the city hall, Ira Vlaso. My name is in Russian was, is Ira as well. And for me, she exemplifies young secular Stockholm with all its 21st century diversity and uh, face to the future. She was born in Moscow, taken by her parents to Israel when she was just a newborn baby. Then her parents, when she was seven or eight, came to Stockholm and she considered herself citizen of the world, but mostly Swedish. Uh, she has very diverse group of friends, she said. And she said we're Swedish first and foremost. She has Palestinian friends who sometimes to tease her, give her the map with the, of the Middle East without the state of Israel. She takes the mark and draws her kind of, uh, second homeland, Israel, and then they laugh and go dancing. She was not aware about this continuous violence in Malmo. And she said, it's not my Sweden. In the country I know in love, we all believe in respecting each other, no matter what your religion or political outlooks. This is what Sweden is all about. Oh, I got stuck again. It's good to have tech support on site, you know. We got stuck on Ira Vlasov. Maybe we should close and uh, open again. Aha, we got it, thank you. So what changed? I hope that after this forum in Malmo, a lot will change, but still in synagogue in Gothenburg, second largest city in Sweden, a Hanukkah party just last year was interrupted by Molotov cocktails. And on the right, you can see desecrated Jewish cemetery in Norway. So what 
lessons can we bring from Sweden? For me, the most important one is, and Alex and I, we have very diverse group of friends, racially, religiously, ethnically, culturally. And what was important for us, it's understanding that not only Jewish communities are vulnerable to expressions of hate and violent attacks, but all other communities, all other minorities, the entire democratic pluralistic society is, are vulnerable as well. I'm often asked, how would we have today? How is today's anti-Semitism? How is today racial hatred different from what was happening, say, in 1930s, pre-World War II years? I think it's very different. We have strong response from non-Jewish citizens, from non-Jewish governments and civic leaders in Europe. And by the way, tomorrow starts international forum against racial hate, hatred and anti-Semitism in Pittsburgh. Remember, it will be three years since the shooting. For over hundred years, not a single American died in this country because he or she was Jewish until the shooting in Pittsburgh. 11 people died because they were Jewish and there would be international war. Uh, in uh, Sweden, we have three points of view. We have young Jews like Kira Vlasova that illustrate unique and vibrant secularism of Swedish, Swedish life, where citizens very strongly guard their liberal traditions. Official position of the Jewish community of Stockholm as expressed by the head of information was that we should not elevate all these attacks or all these episodes to the level of crisis and exasperate too much Jewishness. So like uh, Nika Ro, uh, Rosten said, don't look Jewish. And then you would be, don't wear arm, yarmulke, then you say it. And uh, Annika Rothstein and her circle, they embody the situation where human rights and religious traditions are jeopardized what they consider behind sharp criticism of Israel. So maybe we have to change the continents. If you're not tired yet, it would be an entirely different story. Uh, and go, for example, to China. On the left, you can see Chinese flag and great Chinese wall, and on the right, it's a Jesuit 17th century rendering of the great synagogue of Kaifeng, 1600s. And if for many of you, it looks like Confucian or Taoist temple, it does, because the Jews of China who lived there for almost 2000 years, they wanted to explain their religion to their Chinese neighbors in the term their neighbors would understand. And at the end, they melted into very strong Chinese culture. When we traveled through China with Alex uh, in search of the Chinese Jewish story, we felt overwhelmingly blessed and nourished by the unique perspective and value of Judaism that we discovered in this country. That's why I wanted to put in the opening slide the quote from the Chinese historian. Judaism is a precious stone which needs to be discovered, mined, and delicately carved into an intricate masterpiece. Where would you go to discover a Chinese Jewish narrative? Many places, because there are two narratives. There are Jews in China, the Jews came and left, like Harbin in the north or Shanghai, and there are Jews of China where they lived for almost 2000 years. And uh, for all Jewish history enthusiasts, the roads lead to Kaifeng, the city in Henan province, where you won't have Rick Steves or Father of Romer guides, you won't find memorials to uh, the Jewish life, but you have to meet people of uh, Jewish people of Kaifeng can listen to their stories. And that's what we did. We met with uh, Mr. Jean, he's on the right. He didn't speak a word of English and our Chinese is limited like to uh, one word that Alex knows to say hi, thank you. And thank to our friend, David, we could talk. The, Mr. Jean brought us to the outskirts of the city to uh, the place that seemed like almost feels like wilderness, like forest. This is where Mr. Jin says, the Jews of Kaifeng who settled in the cities during the 10th, 11th, 12th dynasties buried their dead 
for century. We came to his family's burial, burial ground. First, he showed us the marble stella. You see it on the right. Uh, that says very proudly the first monument of Jews in, in English and Chinese. And it's no, uh, no higher than one foot. But behind it, on a pedestal of cement, is a massive five foot tall memorial. It's like a wall constructed of black polish, polished marble. In the nine year story of Mr. Jin's family within the context of Chinese history, written in English, and in Chinese, and it's large, flamboyant, and in stone. He considered himself Jewish. How did you know? I asked him, how did you know we're Jewish? He looked at me like I came from Mars. My father told me, and his father told me, uh, told him, and his father. We had it in Huku book, and that's a book that every Chinese had to have since the third century. According to many historians, Jews arrived to, in China as early as Han Dynasty. It's uh, approximately 206, third century before Common Era. So it makes them the citizens of China for almost 2,000 years. So in this Huku book, everybody has to write what was your profession, what was your father's, what your grandfather's. And in the 1980s, communist police came over to Mr. Uh, Jean and to people who also consider Jewish as far as he knows and removed this book. The book was returned where they considered themselves Jewish. That page was removed. They were written like Han Chinese. But tricky, tricky Jew, Mr. Jean had a copy. He hid this copy. So when the situation was right, he took it out and he created this story of his family since the 11th century when his first, first ancestor came from India. The Jews arrived in China where silk road. So it was the third century BC. Silk was uh, only available in China and Romans, remember Roman empire couldn't get enough of it. So where is the uh, need? There, there is demand, there would be supply. Silk road came into being and among silk merchants were very many Jews that came to China. We went to the heart of, the, of Kaifeng, where Jews of Kaifeng lived and prayed for over 800 years. But the synagogue does not exist anymore, just the gatehouse. And the families that were synagogue managers in the 12th century, they're a, uh, the, the, the representative, Miss Esther, she chose the name of the biblical heroine. Uh, she met us and she turned this little house into a museum of Jewish history of China. And she tells her stories to one person at a time. And it's a story of Chinese Jews of, that never was anti-Semitism in China. For them, they were just different people, foreign people coming along the Silk Road. Whether they Muslim or they Jewish, they call them people with colored eyes, just to distinguish it from Chinese. And I will be talking about the Jewish story of China for the long time next Thursday in Chicago with a virtual option as well, would be only China. It's such a fascinating story. Uh, in the another city that was vibrant center in Jewish center during the Silk Road was Laoyang. And in Laoyang, Alex and I, yeah, I think we were the first one. We made a huge historic discovery. We noticed half a dozen statues, little figurines made of famous three colored tank period uh, ceramic. And this is where peddlers in the heads that indicate that they're foreigners. For us, they had clear Semitic features. They could be, of course, Arab traders arriving along the Silk Road, but they could be Jewish also. So for us, they seemed very Jewish in appearance. So here they are. And we made the, uh, found the proof that there were Jews in uh, China at that time. Now we're coming to Jews in China relative, uh, narrative. It's Harbin in Manchuria in the north, a short-lived century, which was Russian Yiddish cultural enclave. Uh, born out of free will, business adventure, and voluntary resettlement from Russia, the Jewish community of Harbin 
created a unique chapter in the history of the diaspora that distinguished them from other refugees anywhere that were fleeing the disasters, pogroms, persecutions, Jews came freely to start a new chapter in uh, their lives. And uh, beginning with 1899, it lasted only till 1931. But you know what Harbin means? It's a place where fishermen take their um, nets to dry. So this cluster of Chinese tiny villages, the Jews turned into what was called Paris of the East, the music city of Asia, the city with European architecture, with drama theater and opera theater, 25 different newspapers and magazines. You know, like they say in Israel, you have three Jews, but you get five political parties. So of course it was represented in publications. Uh, but Jews, and I have to tell you that unlikely godfather of this miracle in the North was the most anti-Semitic of Russian czars, Nicholas II, who hated Jews with a passion. He practically institutionalized pogroms. But in 1895, Nicholas II government leased land concession from Chinese government to build extension to Chinese Eastern Railroad. So he would have Trans-Siberian Railroad connect uh, both sides of huge Russia. As soon as tracks were laid, he said, oh, we'll need uh, economic stronghold and who would do it better than Jews? Uh, so he let them go and just gladly left anti-Semitism pogrom behind and came to turn the fishing villages into a thriving city. But they could not escape on dark clouds of anti-Semitism. Uh, and uh, when the Russian revolution won and Russian civil war was won by Bolsheviks, the losing side, white army, white officer soldiers began leaving Russia. Some of them ended up in Shanghai or Singapore or Harbin and pogroms started. 1931, Japanese uh, come to Harbin. Japanese were allies of Germany, of course, but they never sign up for final solution. They could care less about the Jews, but everything done anti-Bolsheviks and they look at Jews as Bolsheviks, they would support and Jews began to leave. During 1930s, over 5,000 Jews from this part of the country came to Shanghai. They were escaping. Then World War II happens. The Russian army in 1945 liberated Manchuria from the Japanese. This Russian army comes and Kavadeo, KGB, the secret police. And they liberated few hundreds of Jews of Harbin back to, to Russia, to Stalin's gulags. By 1950s, just few hundreds were left. The last Jew of Harbin dies in 1985. But in the first years of this century, Chinese government realizes that tourism could be a huge source of income. American tourism, to be precise, Jewish American tourism, to be even more exact. And they turned the monument from Jewish life in Harbin, like this old main synagogue is renovated as concert hall, new synagogue became Museum of Jewish History and Culture. And there is the largest and best preserved Jewish cemetery with 900 graves and tombstone signs are in Russian and in Yiddish. And our last stop in China and continuation of Jews in China story, it's of course Shanghai. As you know, that became a safe haven during the Holocaust. There are many monuments to Jewish life in Shanghai. Shanghai is a modern city. It never was an ancient capital of different Chinese civilization like Laoyang or uh, Kaifeng, or not even like Beijing that was built in about 11, 1200s. But Jews come with the British, the Baghdadi Jews, uh, and they uh, brought their wealth and their ability to create the commerce. They built uh, trade empires, and there are many buildings in Shanghai that are still built by Baghdadi Jews, like this one synagogue founded by Sir Jacob Sons Sassoon. Uh, Shanghai was the only place in the world that did not require visas to enter. 
how did it happen? Right now, China takes all the credit. It were us, the Chinese people who always were good to Jews. We allowed them to come. That time, China was occupied by Japanese. China had very little to do with Shanghai. In the 1930s, Shanghai became a political anomaly. Control was split between be the beleaguered Republic of China an increasingly aggressive imperial Japan and France, Britain, the US countries that operated self-governing concessions that were exempt from Chinese laws or Chinese influence. So nobody had to have visa to enter Shanghai, but in the German uh, Nazi government, fascist government in Austria, they required you have to have exit visas. So this is where this man, another man, who made a difference. Uh, it was Dr. Fan Shan Ho. He was Chinese consul in Vienna. He issued thousands of visas. More than 3,000 Jews were saved because of him. He never was recognized in China. He was never mentioned even in the Jewish Museum in Shanghai until very recently. But when he died in 1997 and his daughter fought for the recognition, first of all, Yad Vashem recognized Dr. Ho is righteous among the nations. And in April, six years ago, the daughter of uh, this uh, heroic man placed commemorative plaque honoring her father in the walls of former Chinese consulate building in Vienna. And now Shanghai became very, very popular in terms of every major museum wants to have an exhibit about Shanghai, saving Jewish lives. Almost 25,000 Jews were saved just because city on another end of the world did not require visas. Uh, to the day, it was the opening of the exhibit that already closed in Vienna Jewish Museum about Vie Little Vienna in Shanghai. And now Chicago Holocaust Museum has incredible exhibit dedicated to Shanghai as a safe haven during the Holocaust. Uh, when Japanese enter Shanghai in 1940, they immediately take stateless refugees and create restricted sector, what now we call Shanghai Ghetto, and that's where it was in one of the poor neighborhoods of the city. And it was, of course, it was ghetto. It was hunger, it were diseases, but was not ghetto like in Warsaw or in other cities uh, of Europe people survived, especially with the help of American Joint Distribution Committee and the wealthy Baghdadi Jews, Sassoons, Kadoris, they help with uh, food, with clothes, supporting the Jews in, in ghetto. And now uh, the synagogue that was first established by Russian Jews beginning of the 20th century, it's the most famous museum in Shanghai dedicated to Shanghai role saving the Jews. In uh, 2014, the Shanghai Jewish Refugee Museum unveiled this Holocaust memorial. It's a long 111 feet copper wall with the names of survivors that responded. It were many more than 13,700 people, but that's where those who uh, responded. And the sculpture represents 6 million Jews murdered in Europe. During the lockdown, when most museums uh, were closed, this museum was closed as well, but they work hard on the extension. It's now much bigger, much richer, more detailed picture of what was going on in Shanghai during the war. And this uh, palace of one of the rich Baghdadi Jews, Horace Kanduri, who played a huge role in helping European refugees. So what lessons we bring from China? First of all, the history of the Jews in China goes back to the third century before common era. And there are these two distinctive Jewish narratives, Jews in China, like Harbin or Shanghai, and Jews of China, like Kaifeng. Anti-Semitism never existed in China. What we know now, contemporary crackdown on people considering themselves Jewish comes not from government anti-Semitism, but I believe rather from totalitarian ideology. 
because they do something that never sanctioned. Chinese government never recognized people who consider themselves Jewish as one of the 56 official minorities. For people like Esther and Mr. Jean that you met, the Tao or the way of being Jew is built on family memories. They understand Judaism is a precious treasure. They have the strongest sense of identity. They, they pass, like we say in Hebrew, Lador Vador, from generation to generation. And they prepare to uphold this ancestral heirloom against any powerful force, cultural, political, or economic. In response to the Holocaust of China, we all know now how over 20,000 people were saved just because one city didn't require visa. And because there was one man who issued exit visa, Dr. Feng Shanghao. And of course, another factor was political anomalies that turned Shanghai into a free port, independent from the rest of China. And uh, do we have time to go through India? And Oh, I care. Yeah. Unfortunately, we do not because we want to ensure there is time for questions. Um, so first, let's give you a round of applause. Thank you. Someone's here listening very intently. Yeah. <laughs> Please say, Charlotte, can you wave? Mm -hmm. say hello. That's a nice smile. Yeah, I can give you a three minutes overview. <laughs> sure. And then what we'll do is open it up for questions. Great. Thank you. Great. I think India was the place where you do find the happiest Jewish story. Uh, uh, Jews were in India since the time immemorial. Actually, they know exactly when they came and why. They were the first foreign religion arrived to India 2,500 years ago. And that's the Jews of, uh, Jews of Cochin. You can see Cochin and Kerala in the southernmost part of India. They're absolutely sure. And they tell it to you as if it happened yesterday, or for them it is, that they were traders for King Solomon. And he sent them to India so they would provide trade networks supplying woods and um, precious stones for King Solomon building the first temple in Jerusalem. So they were Kochi Jews, it's still there. The oldest in the world continuously live in Jewish community. It's a Kochi Jews. In Mumbai, see Mumbai is a star. Ben Israeli Jews, 2100 years ago, they tell you there was a shipwreck. In this ship, there were traders from Judea. Whether they were running away from the Romans, from destruction of the second temple, or they were traders who wanted to get in touch with Jews of Kochi, makes no difference. There was a shipwreck, only seven couples survived, and it was the beginning of Ben Israel, so the sons of Israel, of this very distinctive Jews. Uh, and uh, they intermarried with the locals. They became very dark in skin. And Kochi Jews, for a long time, didn't want to have anything to do with them because they did not consider them Jewish. Now it's the largest Jewish group in India. And the third group were the Baghdadis, who came in the 18th century. Name is misleading. Not all of them were from Baghdad. They could be from Cairo, from Aleppo, any other place in the Middle East. Unlike many other Jewish groups, they were not running away from persecution. They came for economic opportunity to British India with its open economic and religious uh, climate. So we have these three groups, each one with their own stories to tell. After uh, 1948, India changed and the Jews, many of them left for Israel. So very few left. So the path of Jewish history seekers always goes to Kochi, where you would meet the oldest continuously living Jewish community and the only synagogue in India and in Asia. We met this two ladies who told us about their Jewish life and their children that they would never ever leave India. That's their home. Mumbai, this capital financial, uh, cultural, publishing capital. You would never think of Bombay city of eight synagogues. We visited two. And the, the girl on the right and the left from me is our uh, guide art historian. She is a uh, Benny Israel, Hannah. And on, my, uh, on the left is the synagogue manager who is a Baghdadi Jew. They now pray together. 
And uh, what Baghdadi Jews uh, brought to Asia was something that never existed there before. They did not just create powerful trade uh, enterprises and they created and ruled trade networks in Southeast Asia. They brought philanthropy. They built landmarks and schools and hospitals. And that's our favorite David Sassoon Library. Uh, so Agra, where you see famous Taj Mahal in Delhi, nobody would think, but these two cities have curious Jewish connection. In Delhi, very few tourists visit Hamayan tomb. That's the tomb of the Mughal or Muslim emperor. But next door to this tomb, is the best kept secret of Delhi. It's a one room synagogue where we talk to its cantor uh, and rabbi and successful business attorney and author is the Kil Malikar who told us that as a Jew, Israel is in my heart, but as an Indian, India is in my blood. And he sent us from all places to the mosque because this is there and that's a typical Indian story. This is the tomb dedicated to the Jew in the mosque. At Sarmat in the 1600s, he was very close to Shah Jahan, the builder of Taj Mahal. And he was a philosopher, a poet, a translator of his many languages that and very close to Han Jahan and his oldest son, heir apparent. Until the younger brother, the evil brother killed all four brothers who were older, imprisoned his father, and he killed Sarmat. But after that, Sarmat, the Jew, who became the essayist, became Muslim saint, great Sufi. He is venerated like the greatest saint in all religions in the anniversary of his death commemorated annually. Another very, uh, very important point that directly related to why we're here. The unknown history of a known story of India's role during the Holocaust. In uh, the 1940s, one ship with 1,200 Polish Jewish orphans was able to leave Europe and uh, Poland and came to the UK, was not allowed to disembark there. Then Baghdadi, Jew, a wealthy a businessman who sponsored this trip, uh, made everything possible for ship to arrive to Bombay. And again, British authorities would not grant entry permission. And then uh, Maharaja or the prince of the small states that now called Gujarat came to the rescue. He said, they all, all 1,200 children, the staff, the teachers, they are my guests. And they, he took them all to his large, rich estate where they lived five years until the war was over. Uh, and uh, even now, there is a square in Warsaw dedicated to Dobrova Maharaja, kind Maharaja. And on the right, you see the photograph of Maharaja with children uh, celebrated one of the holidays, it's Purim holiday. When our friend Malikar in Delhi wanted to write a story about that, to make known India's role as a safe haven during the Holocaust, 1,200 children were saved. Uh, and he contacted Maharaja's son. My son said, no way. My father would never allow any publicity because to his mind, he did what any decent person would do, trying to save any human lives that was possible. So what can we bring back from India? The, are they Jewish or are they Indians? People ask us, but the, the issue is they're both. The tiniest of India's communities managed to live happily and in freedom for 1200 years while preserving their religious and cultural identity and how? Was it creativity of Jews themselves? Was acceptance, tolerance of Hindu populations? Because Jews never experienced anti-Semitism in Indian hands. And what's important that response to the Holocaust of India, uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day is commemorated, but no Holocaust Memorial exists. And Holocaust studies is a neglected subject. Why is it happening? World War II is taught at schools as a foreign war. 
And the Shoah is seen by many as something that terrible that happened to Jewish people in the middle of the war that killed 75 million people on all sides. And 6 million never looked in ancient countries as such a large number, especially in India where 3 million Baghdadis start to death because of they consider policy of Churchill. So uh, that's where we are, four different countries, uh, different continents and very different stories of countries' response to the Holocaust. I have a list of suggested readings, and I'll be uh, very happy uh, if you write to me, uh, contact me, you know, send them to you, or you can get the slides from the recording. And uh, I classified the book according to the country that we discussed. And of course, I would like you to take a look at my book, The Tao of Bin Jewish and Other Stories that has that covers in India and China and Scandinavia and my recent book that tells the story of Malta and Corsica and their role during the Holocaust. So uh, I'll be talking about Jewish story in China next week. And you can stay in touch with me if you write to irenshallant at gmail.com. All your questions that uh, we won't answer today, but I can stay as long as you want me to stay. Is it possible? So please uh, yes. ask me what would you like to know? I'm gonna make this a gallery view so I can see everybody. Um, but please do use the raise your hand feature if um, you have a question for Irene. And if you don't have a question now, but we'll have it in the evening or tomorrow, you can write to me or write to Adara and Cora and they will send it to me. I don't have a question. Thank you very much. And огромное спасибо вам. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye, thank you have very much. Natasha? Yeah. Да. <laughs> Um, Irene, yes. Hi, Sue Kenny. I'm wondering if you could just clarify for me the point that you were making about China when you said that anti-Semitism, you said there were two narratives that anti-Semitism doesn't exist in China. And were you saying that it was brought into China that wasn't pre-existing in China? If, if you could just clarify that a little bit. Uh, your question contains two questions as usual happened with Jewish audiences. Uh, question of two narratives, especially in China, for me, it was evident that there are different stories that tell absolutely different aspects of our Jewish diaspora. And one is the Jews of China that look very Chinese as anybody around them. And I will be happy to explain, and it's in my book as well how did it happen through intermarriages and how they preserve it. It's Jews that came through the Silk Road beginning to two, year 2006 begin of, uh, uh, before Common Era during the Han Dynasty. And uh, the Jews in China, it's an immigration story. It's Harbin. It's a miracle that existed just for 30 years. And in China, the Jews, like all the stories that we know, Jews driven by uh, pogroms and persecution. They were fleeing away. In Harbin, they were allowed to settle because they were Jewish and they took and made the most of it. And Shanghai, it's again, Jews in China. It became safe haven during the Holocaust. So it came and they left. The Jews of China, they stayed. They were forced to intermarry with their neighbors. They were forced by Ming Dynasty to take the uh, Chinese names that became an uh, occupational name. Jin means something like goldsmiths, you know, like occupational Jewish name for Ashkenazi Jews. And they were forced to intermarry, but they intermarried along paternal lines. That's how they sure they preserve the bloodline but they began looking like Chinese. Chinese government 
communist government never recognized Jews of Kaifeng as Jewish, as uh, one of the many minorities, because they have very certain rules. What minority may be counted as official minority, and they didn't count Jews as that. Then Kaifeng Jews became very popular with people interested in this variety, different aspects of our diaspora story. And people began to come from China, Americans uh, uh, Institute from everywhere uh, and talking to Esther, Mr. Jean and going to their celebration and prayers and to their study groups. <clears throat> and it's something that Chinese government could not allow and was not sanctioned. I don't think that if you come to Kaifeng, you would be allowed to meet with any of them. Did I answer your question? If not, you can write to me and we will <laughs> or yes. send your questions yes. to Cara or Dara. Thank you. So I'm not actually able to scroll down and see the other hands. Oh, I see Mila. Mila, you can unmute yourself to ask your question. <laughs> Somebody did unmute it. <laughs> did we lose Mila? Um, yes, I think okay, so. Okay, that happens. Yeah. Okay. I'm not able to scroll down because of the transcript uh, that's oh. going. So I can't see if there are any hands up. So if you have a question, you can feel free to just unmute yourself if you're on a page that perhaps I can't see. Okay, well, I had um, just something that I noticed throughout the presentation when you were going through um, the four nations. I noticed that with the exception of India, with the exception of the present time in India, that there seems to be just more of an emphasis on tolerance as opposed to acceptance and a, a, a theme of like political and economic expediency when it comes to um, the Jewish community in a lot of these nations. And I, I don't really have a question. I just noticed the problematic nature of it and how it struck me as just very sad, you know, that there's e even, even nations like Sweden that were safe havens, you know, or China now under its totalitarian regime, of course, but, you know, it, it's not so much along the lines of acceptance. I don't know if there's, I mean, unless I'm mistaken, it just, I was hoping for a little glimmer of acceptance somewhere. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's a very, very important uh, aspect that you brought up, even in Sweden, and we know that by early 1930s, 3,000 European Jews came to Sweden, but then Sweden, just like many other countries like United States, they wanted drastically limit the number of Jews getting into the country, but at the same time, when they allowed, they were tolerant to Jews coming over, they allowed Germans uh, German army to march through Sweden into Norway. They allowed German companies to fire their Jewish employees. And uh, I always had to remember that Sweden that is leader in Holocaust education in Europe, they work, they have a Corvinian curriculum that's supposedly the best. Sweden was the country where the first scientific research institute on biology of race was founded in 1929 because they wanted to prove that uh, Nordic race is the most advanced race among all others. So when we talk about acceptance, it's very different. And even during the Holocaust, allowing, saving Danish Jewry, saving a Norwegian Jewry, doing this white buses project, supporting Wollenberg. You know, Swedish, Sweden sent a uh, priced uh, iron ore to Germany to support their military machine. It was at the same time. So for me, Sweden now is in a different pedestal. They bystander among the nations. No states have morals. They have only their agenda and interest. That was the same in Sweden. So I think uh, they seldom use acceptance, at least in publication. And Alex and I were streaming and watching the opening of this 
publicized forum that we have so much hope for, they did not even use acceptance. They were talking about teaching tolerance, teaching Holocaust education and tolerance in understanding uh, differences. Wow, thank you. It's unfortunate, but I, I think yeah. it's really important to highlight for just, um, you know, like just everybody's awareness when we have websites, just as a, for instance, like Learning for Justice used to be called Teaching Tolerance and they have since changed their name to avoid such, you know, a stigma of just simple tolerance because it's it's certainly not enough. Um, no. But I think no. that it's, I think that it's important to note that even these nations that are considered to be the most progressive or are considered to be the most accepting, really, we need to change the vocabulary to reflect the reality. So thank yeah, that's you. That's a power of words. And that I'll take every step toward less violence, more understanding, and sure. peaceful life. Where if you want to wear a yarmulke, wear a yarmulke. I'll uh, keep on. You know, Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes, Mark. Yes. Oh, hello. hello. Good. Sorry. Last time I was on this, it wasn't picking up my um, microphone, so I'm sorry. Based on what you were saying about um, uh, what you were just saying about Sweden, is that why that memorial was so, as you claimed, like the language on there was unsatisfactory? Because I was, you know, you said, you know, the road was straight when Jews were deported to death. Mm -hmm. The road was winding. Um, I kind of see where they're going with the quote. You know what I mean? Um, but you said it was controversial based on what you were saying about S Sweden and let's say maybe their role in allowing Germany through or giving them materials for the German war machine. Is that, is that why it was so controversial or what was so bad, I guess, about the language? Was it because of Sweden's kind of background role before and during the war or I was just wondering why the, the language was so, I guess, unsatisfactory and why the memorial itself was so controversial. What did it not do enough? I guess uh, I just wanted a little more details on that. And it probably depends where people would be coming from to this memorial, what they would expect from it. Wallenberg means so much to many of us for what he did, for his courage, his commitment to life, for what he was trying to do, saving so many lives. And just the fact that he was never recognized as he should be in his own country and what happened to him. And then it's too, for us, it was too abstract. It did not say anything in the phrase itself. And this abstract sculptures that were thrown uh, all over the place. It, you know, we studied, Alex and I traveled through the world studying Holocaust memorials and what they represent. And I'm sure you know, if you have not visited, you definitely saw photographs of Berlin Holocaust Memorial. It's not called Holocaust, it's a memorial to the murdered, uh, to the Jew, to the murdered Jews of Europe. It's like you in a necropolis where humanity lost touch with civilized feelings. You're not, you know, you're going on the slopes. You're not uh, in command of yourself, even of your own body. Or there is memorial in Budapest with the shoes, you know, along the, the Danube River. They very impressive, they get to you, you'll never forget it. And in Wallenberg, it was just this granite globe and the sculptures that didn't say much, at least to us. And I know that it was a lot written. What's all about? What does it say about Wallenberg? What does it say about the fate of 22 uh, Jewish communities across Europe? All right, that I can yeah. certainly understand. Thank you. It's true, thank you. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Uh, apparently Charlotte doesn't though. She has lots of questions over here. Um, she can send me email. I will send you pictures. She has been performing the entire program. So yeah, um, it, it's watching and listening. Um, I can only imagine how difficult the last year and a half has been for you and Alex, not being able to travel. I cannot begin to imagine. Um, 
but on behalf of the Goldberg English household and the Holocaust Resource Center, I'm going to let her, yes, sure, we all see you. Yeah, and we agree with you. That's all she wanted. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for taking the time today you know, to share with us, to enlighten us, and to introduce us to parts of the globe that we would probably never get to otherwise. And yes, and she was. when we get there, I think we'll be able to view things through a more nuanced lens. I meant to ask different questions than we may have been able to otherwise. So thank you very much. And again, if you to our teachers for being here, they have been going since probably seven o'clock this morning. And they are extraordinary. And so a thank you to all of you. We will be sending out, okay, we get it. Um,